Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Side by Side with the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, and Substance Use Services, Improving Our System Together monthly webinar. Before we get started, here are a few reminders about the webinar technology. Please make sure you're using a computer or smartphone connected to the internet and the audio function is on and the volume is turned up. Please make sure your microphone is muted for the duration of the call unless you're speaking or asking questions. Questions can be submitted anytime during the presentation using the Q&A feature located on your control panel. We will answer as many questions as time allows after the presentation. American Sign Language Interpreters and Closed Captioning options are available for today's event. The American Sign Language Interpreters for today are Danette Steelman Bridges and Karen Magoon. For closed captioning options, select the closed caption feature located on your control panel. To adjust the video layout and screen view, select the view feature located in the top right-hand corner of your screen and choose the view that works best for you. Today's agenda topics include introductions and MHSU IDD TBI system announcements and updates. Our focus today is the behavioral health workforce. We will discuss the peer and DSP workforce followed by a panel discussion with our guest licensed professionals. There will also be time for questions after the presentation. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Kelly Crosby, Director of the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, and Substance Use Services. Thank you so much, Tina. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kelly Crosby, and I'm the Director here at the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, and Substance Use Services. We've got a lot to cover today. There are some wonderful speakers from our team, and then I'm very excited about a panel of licensed professionals who are working here in the public mental health substance use IDD and TBI system. Um, and so we want to save lots of time for them as well. First, I'm gonna go through some announcements before I tee up our main topics today. And today's topics are workforce. So we wanna give you an update of how we are proceeding with our all of the work we're doing around lifting up peer support specialists, making sure we have a, a, an easy to manage and effective certification program. And most importantly, that we're getting peers into our workforce because we know that peers provide life-changing support. We're also gonna get an update on our direct support professional workforce um, and all the different efforts underway there to again, increase the number of direct support professionals in our system, meaning more people can get access to services. And then we are going to talk today with some panel of licensed professionals. We're gonna tee up the work we're going to start in that space, um, which is making sure we have more licensed professionals coming into the public system and staying. But we're gonna start with an open and honest conversation with some of the LPs in our field to tell us why they like working in the field, what's hard about working in the field, um, and what we could do to potentially improve and increase participation of the licensed professionals in the field. All right, next slide, please. All right, I mentioned our guest speakers. So Anne-Marie Webb is leading our peer support specialist work and Tina Barrett is leading our direct support professional work. Uh, this is just a little bit about them. We try to make sure that folks know uh, who's speaking and you get to know our staff at every opportunity. So they will be talking a little bit later. Next slide, please. All right, so first I'm going to do the usual system announcements and updates. And we actually have a lot of them today. So let's start with the first one. This is our August side-by-side uh, -side webinar. Um, again, workforce is the topic of this month's. We show you this slide just to let you know that there are many opportunities um, to engage with us where we want to engage with you actually is probably a better way to put it. So um, these are all public meetings. Everyone is welcome to come to them. Um, and at the bottom, you will see um, that we have specific advisory groups dedicated to helping us uh, to smartly, wisely invest the money that the General Assembly gave us during the long session. There's a hot link on here. You are welcome to join any of our advisory groups at any time. Um, that form will also help you fill out um, our, to get on our mailing list so you know all about the side-by-sides, but also you get our hot topics where we do everything from announced funding opportunities to just giving general announcements about happenings in the public system and in our field. Next slide. 
Overdose Awareness Week is coming up. This is incredibly important. Unfortunately, over the past several years, we've had rising numbers of overdose deaths. I know this is a subject that's near and dear to everyone's, everyone's heart. Professional, not professional, you have it in your personal life. It's affecting our communities every single day. We're doing a lot to combat overdose here in North Carolina, so thank you for your partnership in helping. We do see bright spots, but we need to keep working to make sure that we are uh, helping from everything from prevention to recovery-based treatment to even um, overdose recovery medications and follow-up. So we're doing a lot in that space. We'll do more um, uh, towards the end of the month to highlight and celebrate some of the work in that overdose space. Next slide, please. Just really wanted to share a really special experience that we had. I don't know if Lori Coker or any of her team are on the call today. We got to visit Green Tree last week. It was a wonderful experience. There are just some photos from our visit where we got to meet with the staff. You know that peers are incredibly important to our recovery system here in North Carolina. Uh, peers are just wonderful and special and valuable. And uh, that visit was great. We got to hear about all the great recovery focused programs that Lori and all the peers there at Green Tree are, um, um, are supporting. So that was an awesome visit and well in keeping with one of our topics today. Next slide, please. We also celebrated the two year anniversary of the 988 call center and that's just us. Uh, they're visiting Real, uh, Real, which is our call center vendor. They manage 988, they've been doing it for a long time uh, before it was even officially 988. We continue to have an incredibly high volume of callers every month. About 8,000 people call 988 every month. We have a very quick response time. We have very few dropped calls. We've had over 190,000 callers um, since the line opened in July of 2022. Every month we post the dashboard, so please go and look at that dashboard. It shows where we're getting calls, the age groups of folks who call, chat or text, um, the reasons that they are calling, and we're trying to be both transparent about that data, but also responsive to it. Next time we talk about crisis, we'll continue to talk about all the enhancements we're making to the crisis system. This is a really important announcement. Um, school is starting. Some folks already went back to school, um, but some are gearing up to go back to school. There is, we wanted folks to know that there is free material available for schools on 988. And this is everything from posters for classrooms, um, videos that you can use, social media posts. Um, the Open to Care is actually a 988 campaign, but it was specifically targeted for um, uh, youth. It was a youth campaign. So it was aimed at helping parents know how to talk to their, um, to their children about, um, um, about suicide and also um, adolescent friendly uh, posters and materials. So, but they're both 90 day campaigns, free materials available to schools. We've been advertising this everywhere and lots of schools and communities are taking us up on it. Please spread the word. We'd love to get these materials out to schools. Next slide, please. Um, this one is really exciting. This is all 988. Um, that, yes, that is me, but focus on my 988 shirt, not on me. Um, we got to sponsor a Dora Bulls game last week. It was really awesome. Uh, we had a table and Jennifer, if you know Jennifer Mead, she's awesome. She was giving out stickers to all the kids and we were able to talk and promote 988. We received the game ball. So I have the game ball sitting over there in my office. Um, and, uh, but most importantly, um, when we received the game ball, they were able to give an announcement about 98, which was just a special moment. It was a special moment with thousands of people to be able to say, you matter. There's no shame. Here's a number to call from help. We need you here tomorrow. So it was a really special uh, moment. So thank you to the Durham Bulls um, and the team that was there um, and everybody who made that happen. Next slide, please. Changing gears a little bit. I want to remind folks about our um, very important Inclusion Works campaign. Remember Inclusion Connects? You might not, but Inclusion Connects is the campaign that we announced several months ago here at DMHGDSUS. And it's focused on getting folks with intellectual developmental disabilities into services. So things like the iOption, we had our iOption um, uh, session a couple of weeks ago. Um, and things like tailored care management. So having folks know about services, especially people who are on the waiting list. It is also about our direct support professional plan. So to get more people in 
uh, to get more folks in direct support professional jobs and working with more people. Tina's gonna talk more about that today. But the third, uh, another part of it is Inclusion Works. Inclusion Works is about competitive integrated employment. Remember, we want people with intellectual developmental disabilities to understand the full continuum of where they can work to make the choices of where they want to work. It can be anywhere, there's no wrong answer. But competitive integrated employment is very much about people who want to work in inclusive workspaces. Um, they should. People should be able to work wherever they want to work and get paid a fair wage and have the same opportunities for career advancement as anyone else. So we have an advisory committee that is just starting here, the Inclusion Works Advisory Committee. We want family members. We want consumers. We want providers um, to join that committee. We want LMEMCOs. And we need this committee to give us feedback on our competitive integrated employment strategy here in North Carolina. And that will be everything from helping us with our advertising and training campaigns. We'll also give out transformation scholarships to employment providers who want to maybe change the way they do business or modernize. Um, so there's a lot of real opportunities, but we need feedback. We need feedback from community on um, how we can create inclusive work communities and make sure that folks have choice of where they want to work whenever they want to work. Okay, so there's a link there. Feel free to sign up for that Inclusion Works Advisory Committee. We would love to have you join. Next slide, please. Um, there's a webinar coming up very soon. So in about eight days. We, very exciting, as part of Inclusion Works, we are able to give out incentives to employment providers. So providers of ADVP, adult day vocational, long-term community support. We're able to give out grants to providers who may want to change the way they do employment services, but that can be really expensive. Or they would like to change employment services, but they need additional supports for consumers or for staff or for programming efforts. So this webinar will talk about grants that providers can get to transform the way they do employment practices. So please register for that webinar. Come on out. We want to tell folks about these grant opportunities. Next slide, please. We also have an Inclusion Works Lunch and Learn coming in two weeks. We have these Lunch and Learns every month. I don't know if you know that. It's really cool. We're able to lift up um, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are in inclusive work settings in our communities, which is really cool and the way the world should be. We're able to lift up employers who are doing cool and unique things. Um, we're just able to talk about best practices. Um, so these Lunch and Learns are really neat. So please come. Um, this Lunch and Learn is actually going to talk about tailored care management because tailored care management can help people get connected to job supports. Um, so please come to the next Lunch and Learn in two weeks. Again, there's a QR code and there's a hot link so you can register for that webinar. Next slide. I think that we're getting down to the end of my slides, but we have another funding opportunity to talk about. As a reminder, hopefully if you've been coming to these meetings, you know that part of the funding we got from the General Assembly was for services and supports for individuals with mental health and substance use and IDD and TBI who were involved in the justice system. Um, we are about to release a request for funding for communities who want to develop additional diversion and reentry programs for people in the justice system. Remember, the goal is to get people in treatment, not incarcerated, right? For those who are incarcerated, we want to help them um, be able to connect to the community uh, when they are released. Some communities have thriving, wonderful programs. Others have nothing. So we want to make sure that we're offering a competitive funding opportunity for all communities who want to build and support these programs for people. Next slide. Okay, our strategic plan. Our strategic plan should come out in about a month. We just wanted to share with you that we got a lot of comments and I wanna thank you for your comments. I've got so many verbal comments. We got so many written comments from individuals, from um, organizations. We truly appreciate people taking the time to read the strategic plan and commenting on it. So on this slide, you're going to see some frequent themes that we heard. Um, uh, we got uh, feedback on making sure that we were addressing things like consumer direction in our workforce initiatives. Um, overall, people were very supportive of the focus on crisis and improving the crisis system. And there was definitely a lot of support for the workforce programs that we talked about in the strategic plan. So we're going to publish the strategic plan, which will include the programs we're doing to move the ball on these goals. And we'll also start publishing our measures that show you how we are doing 
um, to meet the goals in our strategic plan. So that is coming very, very soon. We had a great meeting on it today and it's shaping up very nicely to be finalized. But today I just wanted to thank everyone for all of your feedback, incredible feedback in the meetings and written feedback. So we truly appreciate it. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'm going to turn things over to our first speaker. So Anne-Marie Webb is our first speaker and this says behavioral health workforce, but let me just correct that right now, okay? In, in the legislation, we got money for a behavioral health workforce. And we have, um, we, we are um, uh, trying to be better with our language, to be clear what we mean in that space. And what we are doing is applying that money to initiatives um, in the mental health space, the substance use space, the IDD space and the TBI space. And, and I wouldn't call those all behavioral health. That's it's a bit of a misnomer. So we're using this to strengthen our mental health substance use IDD and TBI workforce. So we're gonna talk about peers today because again, very important in our recovery system. And we're going to talk about our direct support professional strategy. And then we're gonna talk about licensed professionals, which is new. You know, we don't have an advisory group on that yet, but today will be the beginning of some of the work in that space. But on the next slide, I think I'm doing this, yes. As a reminder, one of the goals in our strategic plan is to strengthen the workforce. And look at our four areas of focus. We're gonna talk about three of the four today. One is strengthening the peer workforce. Anne-Marie's gonna give us an update. The second is strengthening the direct support professional workforce. Tina's gonna give us an update. And I'm gonna tee up our awesome panel. We want to start understanding and unpacking why we are struggling to get licensed professionals to come and stay in our public system. I'm gonna define what I mean by public system and then we're gonna talk about some of the barriers and struggles. The last thing we're not gonna talk a lot about today, but we really want to focus then on uh, qualified professionals, associate professionals, paraprofessionals. That actually makes up the bulk of our workforce. We have North Carolina specific law on what that means, but that really needs to be modernized. And we need to look at ways to ensure that we are working with academic institutions, high schools to train a qualified workforce. And then also really use some of the programs that we already have in place to get those folks coming into the public system. But more on that at another time. Next slide. All right, so I think I mentioned this. We're gonna talk about this today, our investments to strengthen our mental health substance use and IDD workforce. Uh, some of them we've already put into place like increasing rates for mental health and substance use services. Anne Marie's going to talk about peers. Tina's gonna talk about direct support professionals. Um, and next slide, please. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Anne Marie Webb, who's gonna give an update on the work we've been doing in the peer work group. So hopefully some of this will be news to people that aren't intimately involved in the working groups. But if you're in the advisory group, hopefully this all resonates because it is part of what you helped us shape. So thank you for that. And I will turn this over to Anne Marie. Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me. It's great to be here. If we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So our first um, thing is going to be expanding high quality peer services. So we have a vision to create robust um, recovery infrastructures throughout each community and each region of the state. We want to make sure that we're expanding recovery or respite centers and peer led organizations. Um, we want to use mental health block grant funding and things such as that to do this. Um, we want to standardize statewide peer designation programs. So this is including um, people who have IDD and TBI, creating the curriculums for them. And older adults, which we currently have and we are already training individuals, it's called the COPES. It's a Certified Older Adult Peer Support Specialist Training. And that's just for individuals to work with the older population as well as to assist like the caregivers and understanding what it's like to growing having an individual in the older system. Um, and then as well as looking at youth programs, family peers, things such as that. And then we're also talking about crisis, forensic, any type of things. Um, and then we wanna do ongoing support for peers and providers. Next slide. So these are many different programs that we are working on at DMHDD SUS, as well as different partnerships like UNCPHS um, and the community college system. So this is a basic timeline of what we're doing. And so we're gonna go over some of these. Next slide. 
So current initiatives, we are working on the standardized curriculum. Um, and we developed a committee. We had an outstanding number of applications. Of a, We had over 200 applications that we received from across the state, and we were able to pick 16 individuals. They are all certified peer support specialists. Um, they are either from one of the three regions, which is the eastern, central, or western region, or they work in the entire state. Um, and they had their first meeting on July 22nd, and we are hoping to launch the online portion of the standardized curriculum on July 2025. The in-person portion, which will be taken at least within six months of taking the online portion in fall of 2025, and then they will also be creating an exam, um, and we are hoping to launch that no later than January of 2026. We are currently accept. oh, can we go back a slide? We are currently accepting um, off scholarship applications, um, and that is on the UNC VHS website. Um, they have just started accepting the applications this week, um, and those to, for individuals to take the scholarships at no, take courses, the 50-hour course certification class at no cost. Um, you have to take all of your credentials prior to your 50-hour course to be accepted for the scholarship. Um, we are going to be working on trying to update the qualified professional definition to have an individual who is a certified peer support specialist with a certain number of years of experience to be able to supervise other peers. We have begun working with the community college to build a new workforce preparation class. We understand that some of these individuals are coming out of recovery and they have no preparation needed to work in certain jobs and employment. So these are going to look like employment skills 101, resume building, how to navigate the healthcare system in North Carolina. Each individual has their own special way of their recovery, but they need to know how to handle the individual serves recovery path. And so learning that path. And then we also have a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring app where any peer can talk to any peer throughout the entire state of North Carolina and just basically have their own peer-to-peer -peer relationship and hopefully help each other with the vicarious trauma that they receive on the job. Next slide. So our future initiatives is going to be defining and supporting um, what these designations are going to look like, how they're going to go. And as you can see, like these are going to be things like the reentry, crisis, forensic, peers and emergency departments, LGBTQ plus populations. Like what can we do to better help train these peers that once they get into jobs or they're looking for jobs, so that they're fully prepared to work that job. Um, and then in fall in 2024, we're going to begin meeting with DHHS, IDD, and TBI providers and subject matter experts to discuss building an IDD and TBI peer curriculum. And then in spring of 2025, we'll start meeting with the community providers to work on that. We also want to make a peer supervisor training. So anybody who is supervising a peer, we've heard from them, like, we don't really know how best to support our peers, um, even though we're supervising them. So we want to be able to assist them and help them fully understand how to support the peers that they're supervising. So we want to create a peer supervisor training so we can ensure that the peers are receiving the support they need while working um, to better help with, again, with the vicarious trauma that they're going to receive in these jobs. And then UNC BHS is also going to be working with the community colleges to build up peer workforce preparation classes, continuing education classes, as well as job matching. Um, so UNC BHS has received job listings already, but they're going to work to build a way to be able to match individuals that they receive certification for to be able to support the job listing. So currently they send those jobs out to the individuals in the area close to those job postings, but then when these individuals start getting these designations and these trainings, they'll be able to better match them to the job specifications. Next job, I'm going to pass it over to Tina. Or yes. Tina, Tina, before, can I just add on the end there, Mamory? marie because I put my heart up. I don't know if y'all saw my heart up, but yeah, I put, yeah, I want to just emphasize that last thing that Anne marie talked about. Um, and if you don't know Anne-Marie, you got to get to know Anne-Marie. She's really cool. Um, but um, the that idea of making sure that peers are gainfully employed is really, really, really important to us. And so we've, we've gotten, we had a wonderful, we have wonderful survey results from certified peers and from some providers, but we want to do a bit more digging to help understand what we can do to help um, employers um, and peers make a good match. A lot of our uh, services, whether they're state or Medicaid funded, you can hire peers, but not a lot of folks are hiring peers. And 
And peers don't always feel valued in this position. So we want to be able to address that issue, right? We also, um, as a reminder, I, I mentioned this somewhere in a webinar, we're using the mental health block grant this year to fund more peer centers. And that could be respite or living rooms, and that will create more jobs for peers. And that's really important to us. We also have some innovative ideas around how to use peers in the IDD space um, and in the justice space and in the older adult space. So there's lots of opportunities. Um, I appreciate all the time the team has taken to try to really get the certification uh, cleaned up, easier, effective. I hope you heard her announce peer scholarships. Anne-Marie, how many peer scholarships do we have? So we have oh, at, least, at least 1,500. 1,500, y'all. At least, yes. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, please go. Um, and we want to make sure that um, these these the certification is valuable for peers. As a person with lived experience, we want to make sure they find it valuable and helpful. Um, and then we want to help folks um, enter the workforce and really help others on the recovery journey. So I um, just wanted to emphasize this part. So thank you so much, Anne-Marie. And then another really cool person, if you don't know Tina, you got to get to know Tina. So over to you, Tina. So before I start talking about the direct support professional workforce, I just want to say how excited I am that IDB and TBI are being added into the peer support space, um, especially as we're doing so much work um, to get people into competitive integrated employment. And it just really opens up one more opportunity for our folks to be able to provide really valuable services. Um, so having said that, I want to talk about the DSP workforce plan, which is something that we've been working on for some time now. Um, the workforce plan, I'm going to start by going ahead and saying that the, the complete copy can be found on the Inclusion Connects website, and I think we just dropped the link into the chat. So um, it is a multi-year strategy that we've developed to help address the critical shortage of direct support professionals in North Carolina. Ideally, what we're looking at is enhancing service quality and the availability um, for workers, for folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It was developed um, with the key components. So, so it was guided by the behavioral health investment funds that the General Assembly allocated, um, and also um, by the Samantha R. Consent Order. Um, I'm not sure that that's posted on the website. Um, we focused primarily on um, DSP retention, uh, strategic recruitment, as well as enhancing training programs and opportunities for DSPs. Uh, we've, we've engaged in quite a bit of stakeholder engagement and incorporated the feedback that we have received from people with disabilities, as well as the family members, our community partners. And we've been very fortunate to have an opportunity to engage with folks who are actually working as DSPs in the field. Um, so yeah, here we go. So our engagement with direct support professionals did start with a survey. Uh, we had over 1200 responses, which we were very thrilled to have. And um, we appreciate everybody who took the time to respond to those. Um, we did note that as part of that survey, uh, DSPs are dispor disproportionately people of color over the age of 50 and typically had less than a bachelor's degree. The majority of the respondents to the survey were have been working in the field for more than three years. 40% um, learned about the role from family and friends. That is something that we are looking at to drive our recruitment efforts. We would like to bring people into the field working as a DSP with intent letting people know that this is potentially a career opportunity for folks, not just directly through family or friends, but also is recognized in creating those opportunities. 71% um, of DSPs are interested in additional training. I love that. I think additional training is always so incredibly valuable for anybody who's working in the field, especially as the field of IDD is constantly changing. 91% of DSPs would recommend the job to someone else. I think that speaks well as to how many of our folks really enjoy the work that they're doing. Um, we want to make sure um, that the folks who are coming into this field are aware of how diverse our population really is and how many opportunities are potentially available when you come to work in the field. Um, our DSPs also shared that they, um, they struggle with increasing their hours or having jobs related to dependent care obligations, other work commitments and lack of opportunities um, that just prevent them from working more. Wages were also a part of that, um, but in addition to that, we did note the other things. Um, so those, the, those respondents from the survey will also be populating our focus groups as we continue to work on addressing that workforce sh shortage. 
Um, so we're looking at several different activities and we have a focus on um, developing the plan, which again, you can find on the website, um, a community college recruitment and training program. I'm looking at creating awareness and recruitment, development of the core competencies, as well as a DSP certificate program. We're also looking at a DSP directory program, association program, um, being able to stand up for DSPs to connect to each other, as well as being able to be available for hire. Um, and then also recruitment and retention grants that'll be available um, both to our agency partners, as well as being available to those folks that are self-directed and working DSPs that are working within that model. Hopefully our targeted outcomes is that we'll see increased community living and support utilization rates. Um, we'll see decreased wait times for services due to DSP availability, decreased DSP turnover, as well as a re reduced DSP onboarding time. Um, those are all key areas where we have um, received feedback that those are critical areas for us to address. So with our initiatives that are in progress, of course, we are working with our DSP engagement. Uh, we are partnering with um, the community colleges um, to create a proposal as far as um, developing core competency curriculums for those things that are required as part of statute, as well as in the innovation waiver that would be provided at no cost to providers or to DSPs. Um, so read that as we would be providing um, scholarship opportunities for folks. Uh, the recruitment and retention grants, again, those are things that will be sent out to providers, um, engaging them in being able to retain staff that are currently working in the field now potentially also initiatives for them to recruit staff into the field. Um, and then also looking at the DSP recruitment platform, also known as the directory, um, which would be designed to bring together DSPs, allow job matching, and looking for folks to be hired. So future initiatives, again, we're looking at the advanced training development, um, the community colleges potentially creating the career ladder for DSPs for them to be able to move forward. Um, also the credentialing process to help prevent professionalized DSPs and coordinating the proposed federal with federal changes. Um, certainly as we're looking at potentially a separate occupational class for DSPs, which would make certainly tracking much easier. And I think that is, there we go. So I'm gonna hand it back to Kelly and let her talk about licensed professionals within the field. All right, let's talk about licensed professionals. And thank you so much, Tina, for those updates on direct support professionals. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Before we get our panel in, I wanna talk about one place that we're starting. Um, and as a reminder, um, I know you saw information about the uh, DHHS and um, Mercy. I think it was the Department of Commerce. Uh, we had a joint uh, strategic caregiving workforce council. It came out with recommendations around direct support professionals and direct care workers at large, behavioral health professionals, that's what they were called in the, in the paper, um, and nurses. And we have been well aligned uh, in our strategies with that Strategic Caregiving Workforce Council report. And one of the things that we are just embarking on is one of the recommendations in the behavioral health space, and that was mental health and substance use. So we are partnering with, as part of our workforce initiatives here at the division, we are partnering with NCAHEC, CHEPS, and UNC's Behavioral Health Workforce Research Center. So a whole bunch of UNC. We are partnering with them to begin to better understand the landscape of mental health and substance use professionals in our field. So as you can see, this is just very transparently the, uh, the scope of work that we are working on with them. But essentially, they're going to help us quantify uh, both uh, what our mental health and substance use workforce actually looks like, right? What, what availability do we have of staff? And that's everything from licensed through unlicensed professionals. They're also going to help us identify where we have gaps. They're going to help us identify the educational pathways we have to get people into the behavioral health workforce, um, ideas for recruiting and training folks in the mental health and substance use workforce. Um, so they're going to really help us kick off um, our work in the mental health and substance use workforce space. So we're very excited about that. Next slide, please. So before I'm about to introduce my panel, and we've decided that as, as, as a way to introduce the panel, we'll show you those pictures in a second. 
we're going to let them introduce themselves by three questions, and we'll get to that. But before we even do that, I just want to kind of level set for everyone on this um, on this, this this webinar. When I say working in the public system, public mental health substance use IDD and TBI system, I want to be just really clear about what I mean. I mean quite simply that that means you're providing services to uninsured or Medicaid eligible individuals, or you may be working at a state operated facility like like um, uh, I keep saying DSOF facilities, but one of our, um, um, uh, like UNC Butner, well, that's not public anymore. That was a bad example. But one of our ADATCs, um, one of our state psychiatric hospitals, the Whitaker School. So um, I don't just mean working at state-owned facilities. A lot of people think I mean that. Not at all. That is one way to work in the public system. But a lot of us just work as clinicians. We provide outpatient therapy, or we're on an ACT team, or a community support team, or we're a psychologist, and we do uh, psychological evaluations for individuals on the innovations waiver. Um, so, um, I mean that. It means you, as a, as a licensed professional, are providing either Medicaid billable uh, services or even state-funded services in our system. It could be a variety of hats. So, if you go to the next slide, this is our esteemed panel. I'm so excited. Look at this panel of like awesome folks that are here today. Um, so if I, if you all could turn on your, your cameras, we've got Chastity, Ryan, Jenny, and Michelle. And I'm so excited. They were so gracious to join us today. Um, and they're going to be honest with us about the joys and struggles of working in the public system. But I'm going to have them introduce themselves. And I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to ask them to say, tell us what their license is, right? Because we have a variety of licensed in our mental health and substance use field. How long they've provided services in the public system, just to kind of like orient ourselves, but also what services. So I will start with myself. I'm not on the panel. I'm going to be the moderator. But I am a licensed clinical social worker. I think everybody knows that. I'm very proud of that. And I've never done anything but public system work. Um, I And that's one of the things we're going to talk about, like, how do you even get here? But primarily, I provided therapeutic foster care services and outpatient, individual, family. And that was for mental health, substance use, dual diagnosis, IDD, mental health. Um, so that is what I did for many, many years in the public space. And since then, I've had the privilege of working at the state level in the public space. But um, some of the most rewarding and hard work I've ever done. But I'm going to go now. We're going to go right down the line and have folks do the same thing. They're licensed, how long they've been in the field, and what are some services you've provided in the public system just to contextualize our conversation. So, Chastity, if you wouldn't mind going first. Chastity can unmute herself, right? Sorry. Woo! Yes, All right. I accidentally hit the wrong button. Um, but I will love to go first. Um, so my name is Chastity Clapp, and I am currently pro uh, provisionally licensed LCSW. I have worked in the behavioral health system for over 17 years. Um, I began as it was a long time ago when when it was called um, peer professional. And then I just kind of work, worked my way up through um through college um, from undergrad, and then I eventually earned my master's from Pembroke. Um, during that time, I've provided uh, mental health, well, community-based services from, oh man, um, I want to say community support. Then I went to um, become a guardianship specialist with the ARC, um, and I did that for a while, and that was the eye-opener for me to really move forward with um, expanding my my career within the behavioral health system. Uh, so then from there, I've just been doing, um, oh, well, from there I went to um, was to the MCO, uh, providing um, transi transition community um, support. And from there now I'm at RHA as their behavioral health director. Thank you, Chastity. Mm -hmm. Ryan, on to you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Ryan Estes with Coastal Horizons. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, a licensed clinical addiction specialist, and a certified clinical supervisor. Um, I have been in the be, um, this space for 20 years, um, providing a, a wide range of services. I started my career in residential services with uh, juvenile justice involved youth and did that for seven years. Uh, before I transitioned into more traditional mental health and behavioral health services, and that's included outpatient, uh, intensive outpatient substance use, uh, foster care, 
uh, intensive in home. So uh, in Coastal Horizons, we run the full gamut. And at this point in my career, I supervise a wide range of programs. That's both child and adult justice services involved. So, Thank you, Ryan. Jenny, you're next. Hi, I'm Jenny Gad, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, and I have been in the public sector for 25 years. Um, let's see the services I've provided. In the very, very beginning, I worked with refugees and they're on refugee Medicaid. Um, and then from there, I did residential services as, as well. Um, I know a couple of other folks had residential. Um, working with folks with severe and persistent mental illness. And I did that for about 12 years. And then I got my master's and I moved into um, compliance work, Medicaid compliance. Um, and so in that capacity, um, I also oversee um, a full array of innovation services um, and therapeutic foster care. And then just recently in the last two years, we've started doing outpatient therapy um, and really enjoying that service and getting to use my clinical skills. That's me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. And then Michelle, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, Michelle Ivey. I am Chief Program Officer for Daymark Recovery Services. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and also a certified social work manager. So the CSWM, which is not as common um, in North Carolina, but I do have that uh, certification as well. I have been in the public system since 1995. I began um, when I was working on my BSW at Appalachian, working for New River, so I worked in an area program and worked with a population that would now be in on an ACT team. Um, that was before we called it ACT. And so I've done a lot of different things in the public system. I've also, um, for a number of years, also worked in hospice, um, which you know, complements the public system, I think, very well. So I always say the youngest person I've ever served had just been born, and the oldest person I ever served was 108, and everyone in between. Um, as far as services, um, ACT, PSR, outpatient services, partial hospitalization, um, so just a number of services that are community-based and office-based services and crisis services. All right. Thank you so much, Michelle. So welcome. We have a, a panel here with lots and lots of experience, age spectrum, service spectrum. So this is really exciting. So I've got a lot of questions and I would love you all just to be as informal as you like and just say, jump in. Um, the first question really is getting at um, like even finding the public system. So I'm finding a lot when I talk to people and I say the public system, sometimes like when I talk to students, I get like this perplexed expression. I know what I mean, but they have no idea. And I say something like community support team and they're like, what is that? Um, so how did you end up in this field? And I like true story myself, I ended up in this field because I was provisionally licensed and this just shows you how old I am. And the only uh, place that I could work um, it was for Medicaid. I could only get in paid for by Medicaid. So a community mental health center hired me because they build Medicaid. So that's, that's it. That's all I could get a job at. So, you know, happy circumstance for me, to be honest with you, but I would say that I just fumbled my way into the public system because that's where I could get a job with a provisional license. So Michelle, how about you? How'd you get in this public system? Um, well, my BSW required me to have a volunteer experience in my sophomore year, and I volunteered with a program that is now a PSR in the public system. And when I finished that volunteer experience, they said, hey, we have an apartment building and we need somebody nights and weekends just to be there and be a presence. Would you like to do that? You, you know, It's the same people you're working with now live in this apartment building. And I said, sure. And I was 19 years old. Wow. And that is how I ended up in the public system. Wow. Good one, Michelle. How about you, Jenny? Um, let's see. So I was given this a lot of thought trying to think back and, um, how I actually ended up here was I ended up in a service learning class in undergraduate at UNC. And it was a sociology class working with folks who were being supported mm. by the welfare system. Mm -hmm. And as part of that job, you had to do volunteer work with a family. And, um, I ended up working with a refugee family, um, and I ended up doing that for many years, actually, way beyond the class. 
Um, and then I discovered that you could get an AmeriCorps job working with those refugees. And I was uh -huh. like, whoa, okay, I will get some money for school. That could be amazing. Um, so I ended up doing AmeriCorps for two years. Uh -huh. um, and then from there, I was also working in the group homes and I ended up just continuing on into the group home work and residential um, as, as a QP at that time. And then later after I got my master's, looking at it more from a compliance perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jenny. Brian, how about yourself? I had graduated my bachelor's program from Wake Forest and I had no clue what I wanted to do. And I was kind of broke. And a residential <laughs> program was like, we have free housing and free food five days a week. And I was like, sign me up. So $20,000 a year. Yeah. Um, and I fell in love with the population. Aww. And so that allowed for when I got my master's to to jump over and say, I, this is where I need to be. Very cool. I'm sensing a theme here. Like none of us were like, yes, public system. Um, Chastity, how about you? Back off and Ryan, uh, you, you finish and you're like, what am I going to do? Um, and my, unfortunately, my undergrad was in psychology. So I was real, I was pretty <laughs> limited. Um, and at that time, um, becoming an AP was something I was able to do. And uh -huh. from there, I just fell in love with it. So write the question what do you do with your bachelor's in psychology right like what do you do with it exactly yep ah oh, interesting y'all okay all right next question ryan start with you how did your education prepare you or not for working in the public sector So I think it gave me a foundation to understand the direct work, how to engage with individuals, but it certainly didn't help me understand all of the system and policy barriers that were in the background. Um, I got more of that when I went for my master's and started to really understand it. But as a bachelor's entering the field, I was incredibly ill-equipped. Same. Jenny? Um, let's see. So my undergraduate is in women's studies, so that wasn't especially helpful. Um, but I was thinking that my my master's program was pretty special at UNC Chapel Hill. It was it's a program for working professionals. Mm, cool. Everyone that was in that program had already been out in the field for at least five years. And it was amazing just to hear a group full of peers and everybody mm -hmm. was the expert in a different thing. And cool. um, that I think that really did help prepare me, although I was already in that system at that time, but it really gave me colleagues that I could reach mm -hmm. out to and was like, oh yeah, she knows zero to three mental health. Oh yeah, okay, she knows Hispanic populations. Who can I call? Um, so it was a very special in that way and that we were already all working um, in the field. It's really cool. Chastity or Michelle, do either of you feel very well equipped from your education? I'm not knocking education, y'all. Not at all. <laughs> Promise. Um, well, going in, um, going into my program, I just was like, oh, you know, I'm going in with one one goal, but then once I got in there, I was able to yeah. actually focus my, my my education on the, the clinical perspective. Yeah. But unfortunately, um, there's still some things that um, that I had to learn later after sure. the program. Absolutely. Um, my MSW was from South Carolina, and I have a I'm a macro social worker initially. Mm -hmm. patient, and so I felt like I was pretty well prepared, especially cool. given um, that. The way um, at that time the South Carolina system was set up, it was very much so um, as a public system and not a private system. So I, I felt that my education did prepare me pretty well for wonderful working. Very cool, wonderful. All right, okay. One more happy question before we get into our stuff. What's been the most rewarding? And that's a really that's tough. That's a big one. Anyone jump in? What's been the most rewarding about working in the public system? But and hear what y'all have done. You've done some amazing things. So probably a lot, actually. I always say uh, my goal every day is to change the world. I just have to do it. One time. And I feel mm -hmm. like that working in the public system allows me to do that. And mm -hmm. it's hard. 
I, I will not sugarcoat it in any way, but we get to make a difference. Yep. Chastity? I agree. Um, so recently, um, so I work in the Alamance County area, and I want to say the most re rewarding thing has been our most recent success here. Um, being from, from Alamance County and also being able to work here, this community was, um, well, now we're able to re receive some services that were that have, have already been desperately needed. Yeah. So uh, we have been able to create a one-stop shop where we house basic, enhanced, and crisis service, oh. including the peer, peer living room. Um, mm -hmm. And as, as we mentioned earlier throughout the presentation, um, peers are so wonderful and valuable. So um, just having that peer living room here, um, I'm just, I'm so excited. So um, yeah, cool so that's center. why. It's a really cool center. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Ryan? Yeah, I think that one of the things I will really just kind of look back fondly in, in later years is that Coastal Horizons was historically known as an adult substance use program. And now we serve almost as many um, uh, families and children. Yeah. And there was a conversation years ago with someone on the adult side. I said, the parent sitting in your IOP is the same family that's getting intensive in-home or family center treatment. And the way that we have brought together those two systems and um, child and adult has just really, I think, revolutionized how services are delivered in the uh, eastern part of the state. So uh -huh. that for me is what I'm most proud of. I love it. That's cool. How about you, Jenny? Um, let's see. So this might be more about being a social worker than the public system, but they uh -huh. go hand in hand and just that it allows you to work with the most vulnerable. I mean, that is who is supported by Medicaid and that's, that's our front lines. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, it's fantastic that you don't have to go out of your way to make a difference. It's part of your everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. That, Thank that, you. I like all the warm, happy stuff. Yeah, it is. It's a, I love this job. Like every day I love this job. I'm grateful. I'm, I, I do feel like it's a privilege. All that being said, it is not easy. Um, and so here, let's talk about some challenges. So in the remaining time, I'd love to talk about some challenges, but also any feedback where we can just start the conversation about how on earth could we make the public system more attractive? It's no secret that licensed professionals aren't racing to get into the public system. Um, and everybody's struggling with hiring licensed professionals. But it's also, you can't dispute the fact that I think licensed professionals are uniquely equipped and trained to do a really good job, right, in the mental health and substance use system, including the public system. So we need more. Okay, so who's going to start with some challenges? Challenges working in the public system as a licensed professional. Who wants to go first? I would say um, the challenges that we're and, you know that I see is just um, staffing. There's there's staff staff shortage and there's a high demand, um, <laughs> and unfortunately that causes um, that impacts our the, the access to care um, issues for for mm -hmm. the individuals here in North Carolina. So mm -hmm. um, so sh shortage within mental health and <laughs> substance substance abuse clinicians um, who want to work in the community because there's a lot of people that. Now they, you have telehealth, so. Say more. So like why, like what, what is it about the system that doesn't perhaps make it the most attractive place for an LP to work? You won't hurt my feelings. I probably feel the same. I, I'll chime in on that. Um, yeah. So the thing I hear the most from colleagues is yeah. the, is the audits, the post-payment reviews, and have no idea how to handle that and the uh, paybacks and that sort of thing. That's definitely not anything we're ever taught in school. Um, I would also say I've met very few clinicians that know how to get themselves in NC Tracks. Um, <laughs> NC Tracks is like a mystery wrapped, you know, like not the easiest system. Um, <laughs> To work with but I will say there are definitely some major pros so those were just the the a few downsides but 
Um, you know, as you'd mentioned earlier, the fact that you can be paid and be an associate licensed person like that, <laughs> that's pretty special. Yep. Um, and then the other thing, because I'm just now breaking into commercial um, insurance, and yeah. I'm so shocked that like there's nobody to really call and who knows who you might get and you get connected and connected. And I'm so used to the MCO LME situation <laughs> and you yeah. like you know who to call, someone will answer the phone, someone will make sure you get to the person that you need to talk to. Um, and I'm I'm not finding this in commercial insurance. Uh, that it's definitely one of the major pros. Cool. I hope the LMEs on the call heard that. Heard that. You don't <laughs> often get complimented. So I hope you heard that. Michelle, do you come off Brian? Oh, there you go, Ryan. Go ahead. I think one of the things that's so challenging about our work is that we have clients that are dealing with so many other factors, all these social drivers of health. Yeah. And so when you're being a therapist, up until recently with TCM, <laughs> you were also being their case manager. Always, always. Um, yeah. and, I, and I don't think that that's fully gone away, even with having a fully vetted yeah. out TCM system. Yeah. Um, and so, and then I think the other piece of it is having done a lot of work in the rural areas. We used to joke in Penner County, it was like the wild west. It was like, we were the only provider. And so it's like, when you've reached your ceiling of what to do, trying to find an ACT team or a a higher level of care in those communities was next to impossible. Yes. It's gotten better. Yeah. But those were two big barriers. Yeah. And that's hard as a clinician. Like, I think we've all been in those situations where you are often faced with really, really challenging situations. And there's, there isn't anywhere to turn. There's not a specialist clinician you could refer them to, or even a higher level of care. And that puts a lot of burden on an individual professional to kind of be all, be all in everything. Um, I know I spent much, so much time case managing and building community relationships and like studying, studying how to help people with IDD and mental health issues because I had no idea, but there was no way I was going to send that family away. I, I was the, I was it. I was the only game in town. So that's a great point, Ryan. Michelle, how about you? Um, as far as the challenges, um, you know, the, the rates for reimbursement do not allow us to compete with the insurance companies, the MCOs, yeah. the hospital systems. Yeah. It is huge problem. And so it yep. makes it very difficult while we may be able to get someone as a new graduate to train them. And then they go get a job making $20,000 more a year working from home. And yep. we can't compete with that. So that is definitely an issue as far as a challenge. Um, all of the different rules, all the different interpretations of the rules. So you have mm -hmm. the tailored plans, you have the, the private Medicaid plans, um, and even getting into some of the ACA plans, people with, with high deductibles, which essentially then defaults that person to the public system because they don't have $8,000 That's right. deductible. That's right. And then um, there, it's very, very difficult um, for us to maintain productivity because of the number of social determinants of health. Now, TCM helps yeah. that, but if a person has to choose between I have an opportunity to take a day labor job so I can pay my child support versus going to my therapy session, they're going to choose taking the job. And so it's an understanding that the rates have to support that system where you're serving a, a number of people who have a lot of challenges stacked against them. And so that's definitely one of the challenges, several of the challenges. So I hear, and then I'll have to, I have to wrap this up with one final question, but I hear themes of it's just, it's just, the work is just actually quite challenging. Where's the support for our clinicians and our agencies, everything from higher levels of care to just support doesn't pay as well as as other insurers where the job might actually be easier and you can stay in the comfort of your own home. There are things like audit. There are rules. There are hoops you have to jump through to get authorizations and paid. There's NC tracks and getting enrolled in contracts with all the MCOs. There's just a lot of administrative stuff too, I'm hearing. So clinically hard administrative stuff. So all of you, last question. If there's one thing you would change that you think would actually, actually, maybe not open the floodgates, but would encourage some more licensed professionals to come into the field. One thing, what would it be? I'll start. Having uh -huh. some type of long reach payment program. We have applied for okay. every single program there is. It is so difficult to get those, to become certified by those plans. There needs to be some way. I always say there's no shortage of attorneys, but there are a shortage of healthcare workers. And so we have to look at why that is. Yep. What is the opportunity for growth? What is the opportunity for income? And what is the opportunity to pay your student loans? That's right. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. One thing. 
I'll go next. Um, so definitely what Michelle said, but also it was kind of disappointing to get out of school and learn all these special techniques and evidence-based practices. And then to find out that no one wants to pay you for them. Ah. So, so special rates for evidence-based practices, I think would really make my clinician heart full. Um, Cause you spend a lot of time learning those. You and do. Find out no one's going to pay you for it. Oh, that's a good one, Jenny. Thank you. Who's next? Brian, you want next? Yeah, I think we've got to close the pipeline. So we're starting these like associate level behavioral health programs, but what uh -huh. are they going to do with it? You can graduate uh -huh. with like, I think Chastity and I both said earlier, so graduate with a bachelor's in psychology. What do we do with it? What do we do with and that? we've uh -huh. even de-scoped so many service definitions that places where you could be an AP like five years ago, that's not even an option anymore. Yep. So we've got the only place that you can get your footing in this profession are the highest levels of care. And it Great. runs people off rather than them going for a master's. It does. Awesome. I'm I'm actually taking notes. I'm physically writing notes, y'all. So thank you. Chastity, how about you? Final thing, one thing. Um, well, I agree with everyone else. Um, unfortunately, I think it is disheartening when when a when a clinician fresh out of school, you we want to hire them. And unfortunately, we can't offer them the same rate of pay. Um, right. So I, I want to say we just continue to struggle with the rate of pay against yep. the private sector. So. Awesome. And I think I would add one more thing to the run and off that Brian said. It's, a, it's a, the same tone, but it's slightly different. I think in our higher levels of care, we're hiring provisionals and asking them to supervise teams of unlicensed folk. That's so hard. And so I do think the job that we're asking folks to do is actually incredibly, incredibly hard in that, just that respect. We give them an opportunity, but the teams, um, the teams aren't always equipped either. Man, that's a lot of work. So, okay. All right. Thank you. I'm so sorry we ran out of time. We may have you back because this was so helpful, but no, like what we did today, we just wanted to to have uh, hear the hear everybody in our community hear about these conversations, but we will be having more conversations with you all because we genuinely care. We know you're part of the solution, and I just want to thank you. Thank you so much. I know you all. I know your agencies. Thank you so much for being really good clinicians and serving in our public system. I truly appreciate that. All right, y'all. Um, I we're over time, so I think I need to turn this back to Dina to finish us out. Thank you, Kelly. If we did not get an opportunity to answer your question during the webinar, questions and feedback are welcome at dhidd.helpcenter at dhhs.nc.gov. The recording and presentation slides for today's event will be posted on our community engagement and training webpage. The links are included in the chat box. There will be a brief survey following today's webinar, and we would appreciate your time completing it. Our next side-by-side -side webinar is scheduled for Monday, September 9th from 2 to 3 p.m. And we look forward to seeing you then. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you for attending.